Brittany, do you want us to start? <laughs> You can go ahead and start, Dr. Davis. Okay. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the uh, 2022 uh, Debbie Stream Foundation Virtual Stomach Cancer uh, Educational Symposium. My name's Jeremy Davis, and I'm a surgical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute, which is in Bethesda, Maryland, and I'll be moderating today's panel discussions. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to thank Debbie's Dream Foundation and Andrea Eidelman for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's always important to share information, not just for education, but for stomach cancer awareness. Um, why does it say show my screen? Do I want to show my screen? No, you're fine. <laughs> so um, for this first session, I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, and, and also thank uh, a couple of our speakers from this morning, Dr. Galen Leung, who spoke on the role of surveillance and endoscopic management of early gastric cancer. Uh, and then also welcome and thank you to Megan Roberts. Uh, she's a senior genetic counselor from GeneDx uh, for presenting on hereditary gastric cancer. And then before we get started uh, with questions, I'll welcome our patient panelists. We have, in no particular order, uh, Angela Huang, uh, Amanda Johnson, Brian Chagola, and Amy Jacobs. Uh, all are stomach cancer survivors, and, and we're so uh, excited to have you all with us today to help us talk about some of these uh, issues uh, that started off this morning. Um, so, so it's now time for questions. And what we'll do is we'll have the panelists weigh in based on their experience uh, or their expertise on various topics. Uh, and, and since I'm the moderator, I get to, I get to start off. Um, so one of the things that we were, we were or I was thinking about and, and, and we were just talking about before we uh, went live is I had asked Dr. Leung, what, what do you think are the most important questions that patients should ask their doctor, especially if the doctor suggests that maybe their stomach cancer is amenable to endoscopic resection. What, do you, what, what can you tell us uh, is your advice? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Davis. I, I think that's an excellent question. And that's why I usually have patients see me in clinic uh, before they schedule their endoscopic resection procedure. Because uh, endoscopic reception can be potentially curative, can be very beneficial, but in the right indication, in the right setting, uh, in carefully selected patients. So when patients get referred to me for uh, EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection, or endoscopic submucosal dissection, uh, I kind of go over them. That it's important to ask me, what are the indications for uh, endoscopic resection? Um, in carefully selected patients, uh, this can be curative of their cancer. But in uh, not carefully selected patients, uh, this can lead to disease recurrence later on, uh, lip node uh, metastasis, uh, to a point where even uh, sort of standard therapy is not uh, indicated anymore. Uh, so I, that's an important question. What are the indica indications? Uh, another is, uh, Sort of what are sort of the statistics on sort of uh, number of procedures performed, um, the rate of complete resection? Because um, I, I think those kind of demonstrate, because ESD uh, is a technically uh, complex procedure. Uh, uh, in the East, it's sort of uh, more uh, done more often. So it's important to, to know that uh, this, and it, West, it's sort of catching on. So it's, I think it's important to know how many of these procedures have been done, and also how many of them have had complete resection uh, rates. Uh, that way it, it speaks to the sort of technical feasibility of the procedure. Also, is the endoscopist selecting the right patient for a procedure? Uh, because some patients who have deep cancers, uh, ESD should not be attempted. Uh, if it is attempted, it leads to incomplete resection. Um, other things are basically, uh, safety of the procedure, uh, 
what are what's the follow-up? Um, given that endoscopic resection does um, provide a smaller margin of safety uh, compared to surgical resection, uh, it's important to have very close uh, surveillance uh, afterwards, uh, such as another repeat upper endoscopy in six months. Excellent. Thank thank you for that. Now I, I do have a, a kind of a follow up question that's that's still uh, related to endoscopy and and really screening or surveillance and then this will tie in a little bit to what Megan Roberts spoke about in terms of of risk and and specifically inherited risk. So um, and 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 I want to get the pa our patients to weigh in on how they came about getting either their endoscopy or questions that come up after diagnosis about, well, should any of my family members get endoscopy? So, so the first question that I have uh, relates to, let's say, uh, Megan Roberts first, and that is, uh, and, and Megan, I can't see you anymore, but I, I assume you're still there, is, you know, what patients, you know, or when patients get diagnosed with potentially a her, uh, an inherited uh, form of cancer risk, gastric cancer risk, um, what kind of endoscopy uh, recommendations are generally made from a genetic counselor standpoint, meaning you know, what kind of increased or enhanced surveillance? What comes to mind, obviously, is BRCA and breast cancer risk and surveillance with, with intense mammography or breast MRI. Uh, what do you say to patients when, when you're counseling them on, on inherited gastric cancer risk? Uh -oh, we... It looks like we might have lost her. Oh, right while I'm asking her. Okay, so let's go back to Dr. Leung then. So, mm -hmm. so when a patient comes to you and says, okay, you know, I think I either have cancer in my family gastric cancer in my family, or is there a role for screening? How do you, how do you approach that? Uh, or how do you approach it in somebody who says, I'm worried about it, and I, I have maybe a family history? How, how does that conversation usually go? Yes, I, I think that's a very good question. Uh, given that sort of in the U.S., there are, there's no general screenings or endoscopy for the general asymptomatic patients compared to Sort of some parts in the East and where patients who basically get, even their asymptomatic, just get a screening endoscopy at age 50. Um, I think it, I, I'd go over sort of the risk factors for sort of gastric cancer. Uh, it's thought that certain demographics, uh, especially those who come from sort of Eastern countries, have a, may have a higher risk of uh, gastric cancer as well as those with a uh, family history of uh, gastric cancer, and definitely those with, with known genetic uh, syndromes as well. Um, so I think in the asymptomatic patient uh, who does demonstrate some worry about uh, gastric cancer, who demonstrates a potential risk factor, either it be family history uh, or a certain demographic, uh, I sort of tell them about the role of uh, endoscopy uh, in that situation. Uh, I do sort of offer it to them, um, saying that, well, if you go down this route, um, it, it sort of entails that it is a procedure, so there are risks and benefits of it. Uh, the benefits being uh, we may potentially catch a precancerous lesion, uh, which uh, in that case, we may need to sort of follow up with it uh, every so often. So, so that's something they need to really understand. Um, on the other hand, uh, it also, like any sort of diagnostic procedure or test, there are false positives. Uh, so there's always the possibility that this may lead down to a road of additional testing, more invasive procedures, uh, but in the end, it could be a false sort of positive result. Uh, so they need to sort of understand these risks uh, as well as benefits. Well, excellent. And, and, and before I go back to my question to Megan Roberts, this is for our patient uh, panelists. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll just ask generally, did, and this came through the chat, did any of uh, the patients get genetic testing before they were diagnosed with gastric cancer? And I'll follow up on that. Or did any of you get genetic testing after diagnosis? 
and, and what was that experience like? I don't know who might want to weigh in first. I'll go first. Okay, you'll go first, and then Amanda looked like she was about to open her mouth. So, 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 <laughs> so go ahead, Angela. Mine is quick. Um, I did not undergo genetic testing before my diagnosis of gastric cancer, and I did undergo it um, after. And I believe that just entailed a blood test, and per you would know, but perhaps just a a test on the actual sample. And, and we're going to come back to that in a second because I have a follow-up question uh, to that. Amanda, what about what about you? I was going to say um, I did test first um, because it was found in my sister, um, and so a letter went out to all of us saying we need to be, all be tested. So, what was that experience like for you? Not the actual test, but maybe just you know learning about it and you know following up on it. Um, it was a bit of a shock. Uh, I, I focused on my sister. We were, um, everything went really fast. So I, um, I was focusing on her and helping her. And then while she was recovering, I found out I was positive and then had my gastrectomy a month later. So, um, yeah, all, all three, all three siblings tested positive, my brother too. And, and just to follow up on that, on both you and Angela's comments, what was your experience or did you interact with a genetic counselor uh, for that process? I did not. I did. Oh, yeah, I, I did, um, but it was very minimal. Uh, when, when they found out I was CDH1 positive, they wanted me to make an appointment with a genetic counselor she basically ran through all the family history and that kind of stuff and then said, you're the first person I've ever had with CDH1 positive. Um, and we just kind of ended it there. It wasn't, there wasn't anything else to say. Yeah. So be before I ask uh, Megan Roberts to comment, I I'm going to say what I believe strongly is that genetic testing, especially germline genetic testing, right? Trying to figure out, you know, what you carry or carried with you from, from the day you were born is, you know, that genetic testing should, should be done in the context of talking to a genetic counselor, ideally before you get tested. And, and on top of that, I think getting tested and then it, having not seen a genetic counselor, then even more important that you talk to a genetic counselor after the testing, and then Megan, I'll let you weigh in, but and you can share your thoughts on maybe the process and, and what it should look like ideally. Uh, sure. Can you, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, you know, I think ideally it is important to see somebody before, um, specifically when it's like a CDH1 mutation is known in the family. Um, there's a lot of implications, I guess, for the family, which could be briefly discussed, but more importantly, um, who should be tested first and or the risks for other family members and understanding the inheritance patterns and risks for those family members, I do think is important. Um, I'm, I'm sad to see hear you say that your genetic counselor had never seen somebody before with a CDH1 variant. I apologize for that. It is not the most common um finding i would say you know gastric cancer is not the most common referral type um, but there are a good handful of us that have a good amount of experience with cdh1 and seeing patients um, with pathogenic variants in those genes and kind of dealing with that downstream um, but yes ideally you know you want to see an individual either at the time of diagnosis so that you can help explain what that testing means, not only for them, but for family members. Um, and then most certainly you want to see individuals, those other family members, so downstream. So, you know, the, the whole goal behind genetic testing and genetic counseling for uh, gastric cancer is to hopefully find what's going on in the family and then ultimately prevent um, in additional family members or get them to the right physicians that can help them manage the risk appropriately. I have a follow-up to that. Uh, 
So for patients with CDH1 mutation, and I know some patients uh, for a gastrectomy is uh, pretty invasive, and I've encountered patients who don't want to go down that route. How does your uh, conversation with them go about that? So I, I will say I probably have more experience with CDH1 than the, the average genetic counselor. So for me, you know, I do know a lot of the literature that's out there, especially the stuff that's coming out from Dr. Davis's group, kind of suggesting um, that upper endoscopy and screening may be an option specifically for families. You know, um, we're, we're seeing a, a different phenotypic spectrum. So we're seeing a different clinical uh, presentation for CDH1 in the last, say, five to seven years than we historically have seen. Um, and why that is, is they've started doing multi-gene panel testing, and which means that they're doing bigger panels with multiple genes, and we're not just targeting the CDH1 gene anymore. So we're identifying pathogenic variants in families that don't look classic. And when I say don't look classic, I mean they don't have this multiple um, gastric cancers and multiple generations. We're starting to see a lot of families actually that don't have any gastric cancer, but maybe are presenting with a few breast cancers in the family. And so they're not um, classic. And so, you know, myself, the conversation's a little different in that probably also depending on the family history. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, there's a, a the, the IGCLC really kind of points out these days that there's kind of two different branches of CDH1 carriers. There's this hereditary lobular breast and no gastric or breast cancer, and then there's a truly hereditary gastric cancer. And so for those families that look truly hereditary diffused gastric, you know, you do have this conversation of gastrectomy is generally that standard recommendation. But for those families that look a little less um, hereditary diffuse gastric, so meaning primarily breast, or you're not really seeing in either of these cancers, you have more of a discussion of upper endoscopy is definitely an option. And let's find you a um, gastroenterologist who has experience with this or has knowledge in uh, screening individuals with pathogenic CDH1 uh, mutations. Unfortunately, I think too many patients are kind of scared off right by not kind of knowing um, that this is an option, especially for those families where they don't look quite as uh, classic. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Dr. Yes, Davis, I... you've done a lot of research. You could probably elaborate a lot on that. <laughs> well, I, 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 I could go all day long, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. we're gonna switch gears, and because I, I, I think that's uh, there's lots to discuss there. I do want to, uh, there's some chat uh, questions popping up in the chat, and I'm going to go to Amy or Brian since we haven't heard uh, uh, from them yet. Somebody wants to know, for instance, at what stage were, were you diagnosed, if you're willing to share that, uh, and, and, and how long ago was it? I, I think Amy, uh, I'm going to guess it wasn't that long ago, right? Um, but do you, do you want to comment on that? I was diagnosed uh, June 13th of 2018, so I'm almost at the four-year marker. I was diagnosed at stage four. And I had two failed chemos, and I'm on third-line Keytruda as a sole agent. I had a complete response. Uh, I'm an MSI high patient, which I understand is about three to five percent of us. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, if any of so for those of you that obviously saw Dr. Moy's uh, presentation or Dr. Klempner's presentation, which I thought Dr. Klempner's uh, presentation uh, along with Dr. Moy's were excellent. You're you're an example of somebody that has uh, a type of gastric cancer that seems to respond particularly well to these newer immunotherapies called checkpoint inhibitors, which basically are ways of either uh, ramping up the immune system or blocking the parts of the immune system that prevent, you know, cancers from responding, uh, uh, um, you know, to this immunotherapy type treatment. Brian, uh, um, would you want to weigh in on kind of either your, your experience with either diagnosis, how it happened, what the experience was like in terms of either endoscopy or symptoms or whatnot? Sure, yeah, I was diagnosed in 
June of 2019 as stage four. So about two and a half years ago. And uh, the way it came about was uh, I, I was experiencing some symptoms like so many people do who get diagnosed at stage four, they experience symptoms and, and uh, by the time they get it checked, it's already advanced. And that was what had happened to me. And so I, I took myself into the hospital and that's where they um, uh, actually found the cancer in a, in a scan and performed the uh, endoscopy there to confirm it. Um, since then, I've been on uh, four lines of chemotherapy. Um, at, at, at the start, I was HER2 positive, but then uh, at some point last year, sometime around June, uh, it changed and I became not HER2 positive. So I'm on a, I'm on a chemo now uh, called uh, uh, Paclitaxel and Ramucirumab uh, since October. And it's, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, it's pro it's a somewhat effective, but um, I also recently had a uh, uh, embolization procedure on my liver with some, some Y90 radiation. And uh, we'll have another scan in a couple months to see where I stand on that. Um, but uh, these days I'm relatively stable. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah. And back to the genetic qu uh, testing question, did you ever have any genetic testing um, that, because I think somebody was asking about the if people's experience with any of that, did, did you have any? Not, not before my diagnosis, but after my diagnosis, I did at some point, I'm being treated at City of Hope here in Los Angeles, and um, they do that sort of thing in-house, and, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't really find anything, uh, 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 in particular, um, I have, for example, I have a very low, uh, what is it? I think the P PDL one marker is very low. Um, yeah. So, but you know, I, I did uh, pass that along to my siblings and have encouraged them all to get screened. Okay. So I'm going to skip along. There was another. There was another question on here, and this relates, I think, a lot to what uh, Amy and Brian were just talking about. And it says, "What's available for patients with stage four gastric cancer, um, where maybe the tumor doesn't express HER2 or PDL1?" Because you just heard Brian mention HER2 or PDL1. And I'll, I'll make a comment since since Dr. Moy's not here. I'll step in as medical oncologist. Um, that that it is interesting that there are certain types of gastric cancers, especially the kind that spread to the abdominal cavity, that they don't often overexpress HER2 or PDL1. So those drugs that you've heard about this morning, like Herceptin or Trastuzumab um, uh, or, or Nivolumab or Pembrolizumab, may not be reasonable treatment options. However, there are other treatments out there, and like Brian mentioned, Taxol and Ramacirumab is FDA approved for treatment in uh, metastatic gastric cancer. And then you also heard about emerging biomarkers and other clinical trials that are very, very uh, interesting and potentially promising, such as the Claudin 18.2 antibody that I think Dr. Moy mentioned in his, uh, in, in his presentation this morning. So, so there are other treatment options. Many of them are, are still in kind of the clinical trial phase, but there are also kind of standard FDA approved therapies out there. Um, and then uh, somebody says, uh, Amanda, that they love your earrings and, and, yeah. you, and can you tell everybody the significance of the seahorse? Well, the seahorse um, basically it has no stomach, so it's become a mascot of uh, CDH1 patients and people without stomachs. That's that's pretty much it. There's apparently there's another there's what is it? The platypus. The platypus. Right, is the other one. Um, but seahorse seems to stick around mostly for most people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. By, by the way, I had a patient from Australia bring me a platypus uh, for that very reason. Um, so here's a question. I want to circle back to Dr. R or, or uh, either Dr. Uh, let me see which one is this. Okay, I'm gonna go to Megan Roberts first. 
Uh, Brona asked, what's the best way to get insurance to cover genetic testing for family members uh, of, let's say, a gastric cancer patient or maybe somebody that's already got a known pathogenic uh, germline mutation? Uh, yeah, so I think the best answer probably is to get a genetic counselor involved if you can. Um, most of us know either the insurance company's criteria that needs to be met and or laboratories and financial hardship programs that laboratories have. So um, I, I wouldn't put that burden on yourself. I would try to put that burden on the genetic counselor that you're seeing. That's a good reason. Another good reason to, to use us to your advantage, right? Other than you know trying to understand uh, the risks and benefits of genetic testing, but then the risks for the family members is to let us kind of handle that for you. Um, it, it's a lot easier these days than it used to be. Most uh, the test, the laboratories will actually do offer pre-authorization through your insurance company and communicate with uh, the patients and or family members, you know, who are getting the testing to make sure that they know of an out-of-pocket cost. And then most of them also have um, kind of programs where you can pay no more than a certain amount of uh, out-of-pocket, if, even if insurance gives you a hard time about it. So I, I think my answer is let us kind of do that for you and give you um, that information that you need, but don't let insurance hopefully get in the way of getting any needing testing tested done. Yeah, my, my, my comment on that would be is that it seems like the cost of genetic testing continues to fall as the years go by. And I'm aware that there are some companies out there, at least if, you, if there's a known genetic mutation in your family, that oftentimes they'll add, offer reduced rates. But again, like Megan says, going through your genetic counselor, they, they, they know a lot of what the com individual companies can and will do because they're all a little, little bit different in that regard. Um, let's see. Um, let's go back a minute. There was a question up there, I think, about um, just how, and, and maybe this is, can be just a clarification by Dr. Leung about what makes it such that, you know, where you might switch between a recommendation for endoscopic resection and, and say, well, maybe this isn't a great candidate for, for uh, you know, EMR or ESD and you'd go to resection. Uh, can you comment on either histologic subtype, let, let, like let's say intestinal versus diffuse, or, or you know, kind of, yeah, I think you mentioned earlier, depth of invasion? Yeah, so I think uh, in order to be a candidate for endoscopic resection, preferably by ESD or endoscopic submucosal dissection, uh, depends on a couple of characteristics, uh, sort of type of cancer, uh, the size, and the depth. Um, so for ESD or endoscopic resection, uh, usually less aggressive types like a well or moderately differentiated endocarcinomas. Uh, those are uh, more preferable for ESD, uh, while poorly differentiated ones uh, sort of may have a higher risk of uh, lymph node metastasis. Also, the larger the lesion, uh, there are two sort of uh, issues. Uh, one is uh, the ability to resect it completely. Uh, if it's a very large lesion, uh, it may not be possible. Or it might be very challenging to resect it in one piece and obtain sort of those safety margins uh, on a histological evaluation. But also, with larger lesions, uh, there is an increased risk of uh, lymphovascular invasion as well. Um, and the last criteria is being depth of the invasion. Um, so, for cancers that are superficially invasive into a submucosal layer, which is underneath the, the top mucosal layer, uh, up to sort of 500 uh, micrometers, uh, ESD can be potentially curative if the margins are negative, there are no signs of lymphovascular invasion. Uh, deeper than that, uh, it's a deep submucosal invasion. Um, it's ESD is not uh, ideal because even if there is sort of complete resection, there is a higher increased risk of lymphovascular invasion, which can be up to sort of 20%. So even though the margins are negative, patients may come back later down down the road with uh, sort of lymph node, uh, positive lymph nodes. Um, so I think ESD or endoscopic resection is uh, sort of ideal in early cancer, depending on the size, type of cancer, and the depth of invasion. Awesome. Now I want to go back. This is a question that I, there was a similar question, but let's go to like maybe Amy and Brian uh, uh, and Angela. 
Can you talk to people a little bit about going from diagnosis to treatment and how maybe your symptoms may have changed, maybe symptoms you had when you were diagnosed, and then as you receive, let's say, systemic chemotherapy uh, or treatment, how those symptoms may have, have uh, changed. And maybe we'll go with uh, uh, Angela. We haven't heard from you in a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I sort of presented to CARE in October of 2020 um, after a few months of dysphagia and sort of early satiety. When I started, when I was diagnosed in January 2021, and I immediately started um, systemic chemo. And within, I'd say, just about a week before my second chemo, my esophagus had opened up enough where I was able to eat. Again, and it was just, it was, it felt like a miracle because I was down to the point where my esophagus was six millimeters in diameter and I would come home from work and I would only be able to like lick peanut butter off of a spoon and that would be my dinner. Um, so I had lost 40 pounds. Um, and so, you know, going from feeling weak, skeletonized to uh, just having that ability to eat again, I thought chemo was the best thing ever. And what about you, Amy? Well, I went through a back door because I dialed 911 one night and got rushed to the hospital and I had a emergency surgery and had a bill roll of two partial gastrectomy. So I basically had lost enough weight. I was like 95 pounds after the surgery. So I had to gain weight, recover from the surgery in the end of June and start chemo in August. So I gained the weight. I got back up to about 123. Started chemo. Horrible for the next eight months. I just can't describe it. Improper adjectives. Nothing felt good. Nothing felt good. When I started immunotherapy and finally the chemo wore off, it was like a game changer. You see me, what I look like now? I was a stick figure, 95 pounds, four years ago. You know, there's nothing I could say nice about chemotherapy. But immunotherapy and targeted therapies are really our future. I think that's a great comment. And before I get to Brian to comment, I, I, I will tell you from, from, from my observation, and again, Dr. Moy isn't here, so I'm gonna play, you know, uh, you know, medical oncologist in addition to surgical oncologist is that there's a big difference between getting chemo when you still have your stomach. And like Angela said, if you have your stomach and you're having problems swallowing and eating, a lot of times the chemo, even though it can make you feel like crap, if it's shrinking the tumor and then you can eat and drink and gain weight, it, it, it's a, a paradoxical kind of effect, right? Where, where ironically you feel better. The difference is, is getting chemotherapy after surgery, for the most part, it's horrible because you don't have the same ability to kind of deal with the chemotherapy in terms of nausea, vomiting, appetite, et cetera. And, 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 and if you look at a lot of the studies that have been done over the last couple of decades, the number of people that can tolerate chemotherapy after surgery or gastrectomy is rather low. Uh, and, and, and Amy, you're right, a lot of these targeted therapies, whether it's ramaciramab, whether it's Herceptin, whether it's immuno, immunotherapy, like with pembrolizumab or, or whatnot, the side effect profile is, 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 is much, much different. They're generally better tolerated. They still have side effects, right? Herceptin can hurt your heart. Uh, immunotherapy can have side effects too. But in general, you're right, they're, 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 they're much easier on people. And, and Brian, I don't know if you want to weigh in on anything else that, that Amy or Angela kind of said and kind of their, their, their views of chemotherapy being slightly different. Uh, well, I, I had a similar experience with, as Angela talked about, where when I started chemotherapy, I was in a lot of pain in my abdomen. I had difficulty swallowing. And, and I would say within a month after I started the chemo, um, the tumors were obviously shrinking, which... As you, as you said, Dr. Davis, the, as the tumors are shrinking, it relieves a lot of just pressure and pain. And then, then I was able to begin to eat a little better and uh, the pain was going away. And so 
uh, I was noticing pretty immediately that a lot of those symptoms were, were starting to go away. Um, now, however, I started to get neuropathy and nausea and fatigue and all that stuff. So it was a trade-off, I guess. But um, and, and I do also, I just want to second what Amy said about immunotherapy and targeted therapy and how that's, I think, really just the, the way of, of future cancer treatments. I was on a targeted chemo last year called in HER2 back when I was HER2 positive, and it, it worked extremely well for me in the months of February and June of last year. It worked so well that at a certain point it stopped working because there were no more HER2 cells to target. However, I still had some other cancerous cells that then grew um, that the HER2 didn't target. So and that puts me where I'm at today. I think your your guys' insights are, are 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 spot on, and this is really important for people to understand kind of the differences. Not all chemo is chemo, right? Um, now there's a question down here that I think is gonna bring back in both Megan Roberts and Dr. Leung, but I'm gonna start off with it. And this is the question. Nicole asks, I fall into the bracket of no family history of gastric or breast cancer, but I carry the CDH1 gene mutation. And my current doctor recommends a total gastrectomy within the next year. How does one decide whether to do surveillance for a total gastrectomy? And what are the current recommendations for people like me? So I'm going to use the pleasure of the podium to answer this because this is, I don't know, I have this conversation every day. So to Megan's point, you know, there's a group uh, that I'm part of, the IGCLC, where we make recommendations. And the recommendations basically say, if you have a CDH1 mutation and you have a family of stomach cancer, you're recommended to undergo a gastrectomy, right? Because you're at much higher risk to get stomach cancer and we don't want you to get stomach cancer and the best way to prevent it is to take out your stomach. Now, a little caveat there is to say, well, if you don't have a strong family history of stomach cancer, you should consider gastrectomy. So a little bit of a waffle kind of word. And the question is, well, how do we know if you truly are going to get it or not? And the problem is we don't know. Just because you carry that gene mutation doesn't mean that you're gonna get it. It means you're just at higher risk. And what we're learning, and uh, Megan mentioned this earlier, is that there are people out there with a CDH1 mutation and you look at their family and you can't see any evidence of anybody in the family ever developing stomach cancer. But does that mean that you aren't at risk? And we wrote a paper recently that shows that even in families with no evidence of stomach cancer history, you can still find early cancer in their stomachs. So it tells us that yes, you're still at higher risk. We just don't know exactly you know, what that risk looks like in terms of are you gonna get it over time? So what are your options? I would say that you still are, uh, it's reasonable to consider a gastrectomy. Nobody's gonna fault you for that, but gastrectomy is a big deal. Um, and we think, I think surveillance has a role and I think it's relatively safe. And so what I would say is this is not an easy answer. This is not a black or white kind of situation. You have the mutation, you are at higher risk. Nobody knows for sure. Gastrectomy or surveillance, and I think right now most people, and Dr. Leung can comment on this too, out there probably don't have a ton of faith in surveillance. I understand why that is. We need more data. But I also know that a lot of people underappreciate the long-term consequences of total gastrectomy. And Amanda can probably comment on this too. So with that said, uh, back to you, Megan. What do you say for somebody with no family history and, 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 and what should they do? So my approach is always to provide the data, which I think you just covered nicely and we kind of discussed earlier, right? In this instance, um, the recommendations currently are to um, to at least do the upper endoscopy and the screening and consider gastrectomy, right? Um, I think the conversations have with patients from a genetic perspective, or at least like the counseling part of the genetic counseling, it is really distressed as a personal decision. And this is something that I can give you the data and I can point you in the right direction. Um, but it's going to come from within in this situation to decide what is best for yourself. 
And so sometimes my role becomes more of a asking questions and helping this person figure out where their head is at. Um, and so what one patient may decide may not be best for the next patient in this situation. And so I apologize, I don't have like an easy, this is what you should do, this is the best answer. Um, but again, it's it provide guidance based on the most current data and then help that person make the decision that's best for themselves. I think that's perfect. And we only have a few minutes left. Dr. Dr. Liang, how, what, what would you say to somebody or what's your comfort level with, let's say endoscopic surveillance for somebody with CDH1? Yes, I think there's no right or wrong answer that uh, this should be individualized to the patient. Uh, it also depends on a lot of other factors. There's sort of a comorbid status for surgery. Uh, are they willing to undergo very close surveillance uh, given sort of that ongoing risk of uh, developing cancer at any point uh, if they sort of vouch for surveillance? Uh, I've done sort of surveillance for these patients um, and uh, I do very sort of careful exams uh, under high definition white light endoscopy, under narrow band imaging, uh, under magnification, just to see any subtle changes in the lining of the stomach um, and take sort of targeted biopsies of uh, anything that looks uh, abnormal. Um, and also taking sort of, uh, sort of targeted or mapping biopsies throughout the stomach, uh, if anything, comes out positive, I can always go back and see, is there something early enough or concerned enough that I could do an endoscopic resection? But again, uh, sometimes these lesions can be very subtle and there's a risk of sort of missing lesions as well. So it's important to sort of understand both sides that have risks and benefits. I think these are good points. I think the field is obviously evolving um, and we're learning more hopefully as the days go by. I think one of the, we haven't gotten to all the questions, so I apologize if I've skipped over your questions, but I'm doing that on purpose because we're, you know, trying to hit a lot of topics. One of the questions on here, which I think is really important, and this is to Amy, Amanda, Brian, and Angela, any words of hope for others who are on a similar journey or any valuable lessons uh, or words of wisdom? And I'll start with Brian. Oh, Brian, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, my dog was barking. I muted myself. Anyway, um, when I was first diagnosed, one of the first things I, I learned that I, I realized I had to do was I had to learn how to listen to my body. And I realized that for years I had not been listening to my body. And 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 I'm talking about just very simple things like eating, you know, stomach cancer, immediately disrupts the very simple act of eating. And you know, there were days when I would only eat watermelon or I would only eat rice or, you know, uh, but if, if you listen, learn to listen to your body, it can help guide you through the healing. Another thing that I learned uh, uh, that, I, that helped me was uh, it's okay to accept the help of others. And, you know, when you're going through stomach cancer diagnosis and chemo, it's, it's really scary. And so um, uh, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have others around you, whether it's friends, relatives, coworkers, whatever, um, allow, that, allow them to help you because it really can make a big difference. Super helpful. Angela, what about you? I would say for me, Knowing what your goals are, like set realistic goals uh, after you get your head around the initial diagnosis. So I took a look at where I was and I immediately got into clinical trials. So I had my my goal was gastrectomy because I had heard over and over that if you sit around a table of stomach cancer survivors, one thing they all have in common is nobody's got a stomach. So to me, I felt like that's going to be you know, my goal, but I knew that I was going to have to break it up into smaller steps. I had to do the chemo, the intravenous chemo first to get to the HIPEC trial to get to you. And so that's how I structured my whole last year um, was fighting to get to you. And so that's what I would say is set realistic expectations for yourself, but never forget where you're headed because there are times where it will get, it'll get hard and it'll get lonely and it'll get, um, you know, it gets deep, but if you have that goal in mind, um, you can get there. 
So don't give up hope. I think that's 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 great, and 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 uh, I'm glad I'm glad uh, you found me, Amy. What about you? I guess what all they all said was perfect. The only other advice I'd say is don't ever take off your boxing gloves. That's it. You keep them on. I still have them on. I'm here getting Kichu to number 50 today, 5-0. <laughs> so, wow. Don't let up. And Amanda? Um, well, I agree with all of that. And I also wanted to say that um, it's, while it's hard, it's really important to try to keep a positive attitude um, because, like Angela said, it, it can get dark. Um, and finding, finding something positive to focus on is really helpful. Um, you know, the fact that you're here, um, is, is the one that I always go back to. Um, and that's been really helpful to me. So. Well, listen, I think, uh, having you guys on today, uh, was, was, was awesome and super helpful. And I, I know uh, that everybody appreciated your insight. And then Megan Roberts, uh, who's really an expert in, in kind of CDH1 in the world of hereditary can uh, gastric cancer, thank you. And then Dr. Leung, I may be calling you up to, to, to get your help on some uh, advanced endoscopy. So it's great having you all here today. I think uh, we're, we're going to call it quits for this section so everybody can take a lunch break and, and then tune into the afternoon sessions. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. It's an honor to be here.